today's live stream. Um, we're broadcasting from from London. Van Church is based in in Abbeywood area in London, and uh, we're continuing the series of teaching entitled "What on Earth is Going On," and what am I supposed to do about it? Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise, we worship, and we adore you. We thank you, Father, for this glorious day. Lord, we ask that the heavens be opened, that your voice will resound. I ask, O oh God, that you anoint me afresh to bring your word to your people. I pray, O oh God, that your word will go forth with power, with accuracy, with simplicity. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, and our hearts to understand that which you are showing us, that which you are saying to us, and that which you are connecting with our hearts. Let your word find faith in our hearts. Help us not just to be hearers, but to be doers of your word. Let your word prosper in our hands. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we have prayed. And everybody said, Amen. Now, um, in the times that I've been opportune by God to teach on the end times in different places, in the local church, at church conferences, or teaching Bible school students at the Bible school, one constant question that keeps coming up is, if the Lord is coming, and if it looks like his coming is getting really, really close, even though we don't know the day or the hour, what are we to do? I've got ambitions, I've got plans, I've got visions, I've got projects that are lined up. Uh, I'm not yet married, I'm planning to get married, I'm looking for a wife, I'm looking for a husband. I'm in business, I'm looking to expand my business to make more money, to be more successful. I'm looking to advance my career. I'm taking courses. I'm sacrificing time and energy and resources to pursue these objectives. I'm at university or about to go into university. I'm studying hard, working day and night, trying to advance my education. How, what do I do? Do I continue those pursuits? Do I slow them down because the Lord is coming? Are there something else I should be doing? And these are very, very genuine questions. It shows, um, on one hand, a genuine expectation of the Lord's coming and a heart to want to do what is right. And these questions also are quite uh, vital because I think the church history is littered with people who have gone ahead to so emphasize the coming of the Lord to the point of almost suggesting that we stop everything else. Um, and some have stopped careers, ambitions, businesses. Only for 10 years later, the Lord hasn't yet come. And they are full of regrets. And some even become so discouraged that they almost turn their, their back from the Lord. So they go from one, ex one end of the spectrum of totally expecting the Lord to come, hope maybe in the day that they live in before the night is over, before the week is over, before the month is over, before the year is over, and therefore wanting to prioritize the things of the kingdom, which of course we should prioritize, but to the abandonment of everything else um, due to lack of teaching, lack, lack of understanding, and lack of instruction, and then when disappointment set, sets in, they go to the other extreme where now they don't want to know. <laughs> and if you're talking about the Lord coming, it's like, I don't want to even hear about it. When he comes, he comes. How do we get the balance right? What do we need to do? There was this um, story in um, back in the days in the United States. It is said that on one occasion, during the sitting of the American Senate, a sudden and very dense darkness fell upon the city. The city became extremely dark. 
so awful and so intense was this darkness that um, it became the probability that the end of the world was freely discussed in the Senate. And one of the senators was so moved that um, he made a move for the adjournment of the house. So basically he said, you know what? We don't know what's going on. Of course, this is in a, in a country where, and at, and at a time where um, power outage uh, was incredibly rare. But this one was not just a power outage, but it was one that went on for a very long time. So they thought, we don't know what's going on. Maybe the end of the world is here. So let's just stop everything. So one senator said, I know, let's just adjourn the work of the House. Let's adjourn Senate. But another well-known member of the House rose to his feet in reply to the proposal. And he said as follows, President, I pro that's President of the Senate, I propose that the lights be brought in and that we proceed with our business. If the judge comes, he had better find us at our duty. I love that. I propose that the lights be brought in, that we proceed with our business. If the judge comes, talking about the Lord, he had better find us at our duty. And I kind of really deeply resonate with this. And it's about getting the balance right, finding the balance. There seems to be a tension. There seems to be a tension in Christendom. The tension between awaiting the coming of the Lord and yet doing the business that it puts us to do whilst awaiting, without necessarily stopping one for the other. The source of the tension is that the rapture of the church is imminent. It's called the doctrine of imminency of rapture. Imminency means it can happen anytime. There are no more signs to be given before the church is raptured. The signs that Jesus tells us about are more about the second coming, which comes at the end of the seven year tribulation. The rapture takes place before the tribulation for those of us who hold the pre trib rapture position. So if we begin to see the signs of his second coming, that probably tells us that the rapture is even more imminent. So there is that on one hand, but yet the Bible tells us that we should not be caught unawares and that we should be able to read the signs. But nobody knows the day or the hour, the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us. So we don't know the day or the hour, but it's imminent. Then what do we do? But then we should watch and be ready. But what does watch and be ready mean? What does it mean? How do I continue to be watchful and continue to be ready while, and sh should I, while I still pursue my ambitions to, 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 to start that business, to conquer that, that territory, to, to, to pursue that marriage, um, to pursue that, that project, that career, that education, developing myself, how do I balance it out? Plus, the tension is even emphasized by the fact that the rapture has, and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ has been said to be imminent for a very long time. <laughs> and yet, it seems like it hasn't happened. Well, not that it seems, it hasn't happened. Nothing has happened. Do I stop my plans and focus and projects? Do I stop trying to be successful and to break through and to make it in life? And this is the tension that the honest Christian faces in the midst of all this. What do I do while I'm waiting? What do I do while I'm looking for the blessed hope? What do I do while I'm expecting the return of the Lord? The title of today's message is, What do you do while awaiting the return of Jesus? 
what do you do while whilst awaiting the return of Jesus? We're going to look at a particular scripture that talks about patience and persevering in waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's in the book of James chapter 5 from verse 7 to verse 12. Six verses. We're going to look at it. Then we'll look at what Jesus himself said. Two parables of Jesus concerning how to wait, what to do whilst waiting. Now, Jesus spoke a lot through parables. And there are two of those parables that talk about waiting for the master to come, waiting for the, um, the, the, the master of the vineyard to come. One of them is, is the parable of the wise and the faithful servant, which we'll see in Matthew 24, verse 45 to verse 51. And the other one is the parable of the workers in the vineyard, which you see in Matthew chapter 20 verse 1 to verse 16. So let's start with the scripture that talks about patience and persevering in waiting. Turn with me please in your Bibles to James chapter 5 verses 7 to 12. James 5 from verse 7 to verse 12. Therefore be patient brethren until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. Verse 8. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So straight away we see the context in which this particular scripture is written. Because the coming of the Lord is at hand, the coming of the Lord is near, has drawn near. Okay? Verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. In some Bible that even has an exclamation mark on it, so which shows a sign of seriousness and importance to it. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. And the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, above all my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. Six verses. The contest is waiting for the coming of the Lord. We see that in verse 8. And then within those six verses, we see the mindset that we need to have whilst we are waiting. The attitude we need to have whilst we are waiting. So the first thing we want to bring out there is that wait patiently wait with patience so that presupposes you see that in verse verse 7 all right waiting patiently waiting patiently so that presupposes that some people might wait impatiently impatience might make us to stop waiting and unfortunately there have been some of our brothers and sisters who have gotten tired of <laughs> waiting for the lord partly because of unbalanced teaching Maybe they have, out of genuineness of faith and intention, gone to one extreme of responding to waiting to the point where they've abandoned some of the things that the Lord has even given them to do. The Lord hasn't yet come. The rapture has not yet happened. We're all still here, except for those who have gone to be with the Lord. And that can be discouraging. Um, but we need patience with this waiting. Patience is part of the fruit of the Spirit. Waiting patiently. So we need to learn to wait with patience. Patience means till the end. It's a daily thing. Point number two, also in verse, verse two, I mean verse seven, and quite related to the first one. Wait until. Wait until. So in verse seven, 
He says that the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. So until it receives the early and the latter rain, it does not stop waiting. It does not stop waiting. The church of our Lord Jesus Christ has received, if you like, the first rain at Pentecost. But the latter rain is yet to come. The real harvest of souls up when the church is taken up at, um, at uh, rapture is ahead of us. So we don't stop waiting until that happens. So the first thing, we wait patiently. The second, we wait until the latter rain. The third point we see there is that he said, do not grumble against each other. Do not judge one another. Verse 9. We got to be careful that in the midst of waiting, we don't begin to fight, <laughs> fight each other, especially over doctrinal matters, over who is working on what assignment, who, where should the focus be. No, we let the master judge his servants. None of those, none of our brothers or our sisters, they are our brothers, they are sisters, but none of them is our servant. Each one of us serve the Lord Jesus directly. Sometimes we serve him through the assignments that he has given us to work alongside or to work underneath some of the other people that he has also given a vision for, either in the church or the wider ministry. So do not grumble against one another. Do not judge one another. The third thing that we do in terms of our heart attitude is that we learn from the experience of the prophets. What experience? Look at verse 10. My brethren, take the prophets of old. Well, of old is my... I've added that in. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. So spoke in times past. Take them as an example of what? Suffering and patience. So sometimes while we're being patient, we might have to suffer. Now, I know some Christians who don't like the word suffering. <laughs> uh, it's like when you say, when you talk about suffering, they say, no, God forbid, that's not for me, you know. But we see also that even though God hasn't necessarily called us so that we can suffer, Jesus has suffered for us. But we know that Jesus himself said to us that those that must work righteously, will suffer persecution. Jesus tells us how it is. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't pretend. And I'm yet to meet a Christian anyway that hasn't gone through some suffering. I'm yet to meet one. The type of suffering might vary from one to the other. But the point is, and sometimes when a Christian encounters some form of suffering and they haven't got the right teaching about it, they are not prepared for it, it can shake their faith. But we are supposed to be unshakable, immovable. Because the God that has promised is faithful. So we should look to them as example of suffering and patience. So we stick to righteousness. If so be, if we have to suffer certain things because of that, we do. But we know that there's a blessing that comes with our suffering because the Bible tells us that. Number four, point number four, is that... No, that was point number four. Point number five is to know that godly endurance comes with a blessing. To know ahead of time that godly endurance comes with a blessing. So there's a blessing with it. Verse 11. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. We count them blessed who endure. So when you endure, you, you don't endure prosperity. You don't endure good health. You enjoy those ones. So endure must be something that is unpleasant, uncomfortable. And God says in his word that when you endure through that process, some of those things, that there is a blessing that comes with it. There is a blessing that comes with enduring. He said you have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord. So that takes us to point number six. Work with the end in mind. This is not the end of the story. This, when we say your best life now, I don't think it's true. Your best life, no matter how good this current life is, <laughs> your best life is still ahead of you. God has something better for you than whatever great experience you might be having 
at the moment. Whilst we thank God for the experience we are having and the blessings and the things he has given to us freely that we enjoy right now, but we look for that which is better, of a better quality, of an eternal nature with peace and joy that comes from the presence of God. Hallelujah. So he says that we should consider the perseverance of Job and seeing the end intended by the Lord. So we need to work with the end in mind. We have to see the end that is intended by the Lord. What's the end intended for you? What's the end? Where is the end? Where does it end? Does it end here on earth? Of course not. So what's the end intended? When you look to the, from the end and walk backwards and you walk towards um, with the end in mind, you live your life here with the end in mind, you are able to overcome an <laughs> unimaginable amount of things. In joy, in peace, in prosperity, in contentment. Hallelujah. Because the Holy Spirit enables us through all that. Even the scripture that says that I know how to abase, I know how to abound. Um, and that uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's because of the strength, it's because of knowing how to abase, knowing how to abound that I can do all things. The power to do all things is through that knowledge, knowing how to. So he said that we should know uh, and work with the end in mind. We should look at the example of Job and we should also know that God will reward you. That God will reward you. So the end comes with a reward. Next week, we're going to be talking about crowns and rewards. Crowns and rewards. Very, very important. You don't want to miss it. And then the final point here, final, uh, well, the, 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 the last but one actually. Point number seven, I believe. Remember, remember that God is compassionate and merciful. Remember that God is compassionate and merciful. So whilst we are waiting, we must always remember the patience and the compassion of God. So which means when we fall short, the compassion of God is there. When we make mistakes, the mercy of God is there. Therefore, the enemy is not able to take advantage of us to bring us into judgment or to bring us into condemnation. Hallelujah. So we can walk through free of offense and free of the enemy's lies and accusations and criticisms because our God is compassionate and our God is merciful. And you need to know that. So cut yourself some slack. You're not perfect. You probably will make mistakes. You have made mistakes. And with the best of intentions, you probably will still make mistakes. But God is merciful. God is compassionate. If we confess our sins, it's just unfaithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we go from glory to glory whilst we wait. And now the final point, number eight. Watch your commitments. Watch your commitments. In verse 12, it tells us, But above all, brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, let your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. So what does this tell us? Don't be flippant about giving your word. Don't be quick to make promises and make vows. Consider, pray, think. And when you do make it, follow it through. Uh, consider carefully before giving your word and when you give your word do your best to fulfill it so let your yes be yes yes let your no be no because it tells us here that this if you don't do this then we, it can bring us into into judgment or, or make us to become like hypocrites now we're going to look at one of the first two parables of jesus concerning waiting while the master while the master is gone matthew chapter 24 from verse 45 to verse 51 matthew 24 from verse 45 to verse 51 thank you jesus I think for context, to get the context in which we're going to be focusing on verses 45 to 51, but to get the context, let's back up to verse 32. Matthew 24, verse 32. Now, learn this parable from the fig tree. Remember, it's Jesus that is speaking here. 
So let's consider his words carefully. The first thing he says there is, learn this parable. So if Jesus says to learn something, I think it's a good advice to take. Learn it. But what parable? The parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So he says, look at nature. Look at the fig tree. You can tell when summer is around the corner by what happens to, to the fig tree. By the same token, verse 33 says, So, you also, when you see all these things, and he's talking about things he had mentioned earlier in chapter 24. You can read that up later. When you see all these things, know that it is near. It is at the door. So he's talking about the signs of the second coming. When you begin to see those signs come to pass, then know, be assured that it is near. It is at the doors. So when they say something, somebody or something is at the doors, you know that they are, the, the next thing for them to do is to enter through the door. They, 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 are, they are that close. If you're expecting somebody, you know, you've given them an appointment and you are checking up on where they are and it looks like they are running late and you give them a call and they say, oh, I'm 10 miles away. I'm five miles away. I'm just down the street. And then they say, I'm at your door. Then you know they're really here. So when you begin to see these signs begin to happen, know that he is at the door. Some other translation says, he is near. And, you know, know that he's, he's near, he's at the doors. And that's, of course, talking about Jesus. 34. Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away with all these things. Uh, till, till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Jesus is very firm about this. My words will by no means pass away. In fact, heaven and earth will pass away before my word will fail. <laughs> so as long as the heavens and the earth have not passed away, you can be assured that my word, the things that I say to you will come to pass. Verse 36. We're still trying to get a context now. But of that day and hour, no one knows. Okay, we mentioned that earlier. Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Verse 37, but. So in verse 36, it starts with but. In verse 37, it starts with but. But of that day, no one knows. Verse 37, however, as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. So although we don't know, however, Study how it works in the days of Noah, because that's how it's going to be when I come. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Stop. The rest of the people did not know. They carried on with life as is. There was no change to their routine. There was no change to their priorities. There was no change to their heart attitude and to their mindset. They carried on as if the flood was not going to come. Even though Noah won them, Noah spent a long time, years, building the ark. I'm sure they must have asked him, why are you, build, what, what are you building this gigantic thing for? He warned them. He told them. They did not believe him. They did not know. Therefore, they did not prepare. But Noah knew, and Noah prepared. And that's the difference. So watchfulness, being aware, makes us to prepare and to help to get the priorities right. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the meal. One will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, verse 42. Watch therefore. For you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. What therefore? The note of my Bible here says that in a time of indifference and carelessness, the Lord will appear with startling suddenness. Some will be taken to meet him, while others will be left. The thought of that event urges watchfulness and preparedness upon us, just like Noah watched and Noah was prepared. Watch therefore. 43. But know this, 
Know this. Anytime Jesus himself says, know this or learn this, then we need to spend time on it. Know this, know what? That if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have done what? Watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So we'll set the context. Now let's look at the parable, verse 45. Would, so this is the parable of the faithful servant and the evil servant. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Question. What's Jesus saying? So Jesus is saying, in the context of the fact that I've gone, I'm like the, the, the master of the house, the, 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 the master of the vineyard, um, and I've now made you, given you responsibilities, assignments. Um, it says, I need you to be faithful. To be faithful means to be diligent, to be doing the work that has been given to you. Be faithful and be wise. So it's one thing to be doing something, it's another to do it with wisdom. So be faithful and be wise in the way that you go about it. All right? Because it says, him is, is, is made you ruler, he's the master, Jesus is the master, and he's made you ruler over his household. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereon. When God created man in, the, in, in Genesis, Adam and Eve, he gave us an assignment to rule, to, to multiply, to replenish, to, to, to be fruitful. All right? So none of that instructions has been taken away. In fact, the fact that he might be coming soon, that we're coming closer to the time that he comes, whether it is well, in, in, in mine and your lifetime or that of our children or grandchildren, it doesn't matter. It's still soon. Where Each day it's sooner than yesterday. The fact that he might be coming very soon, he will be coming very soon, does not remove our faithfulness to that instruction and to the assignment. Why? Because verse 46 tells us, Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find in so doing. So there is a blessing whenever he comes, whether it is today or several decades to come, that we have found to be faithful and to be wise in the assignment that he has given us. In verse 45, he calls it, you know, made, he made us ruler over his household to give them food in due season so for people like pastors and those who are overseers you give them the word of god you feed the flock you watch over them be faithful in doing that and be wise in doing that 47 tells us verse 47 surely i say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods so it seems here that jesus is saying that there is a greater reward for faithfulness in the current assignment Faithfulness in the current assignment is rewarded with greater authority. The more faithful you are in the assignment you are given, the more authority you receive over more. But if the evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, so there are those who might be thinking, oh, they've been talking about him coming for so long, I'm getting tired of that now, I've got to get on with my life. Well. May I submit to you that your life actually belongs to him? When we say that we are, we are Christians, we even say we give our life to him. So he owns us now. Our life is his. And that is not something that is inferior. As a matter of fact, it's a better position to be in. So, but this evil servant does not understand that. He says, look, my master is delaying his coming. So he begins to be unwise. He begins to beat his fellow servants. He begins to, uh, to, to eat and drink with the drunkards. So that's given the impression of somebody who have kind of began to move away from, from, from righteous ways and, and, and walking in holiness into walking in unrighteousness and, 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 and beginning to embrace sin, sinful lifestyle, and reveling in it. He has now moved his uh, company from that of being in the midst of Christians to being and revelling in the ways of the ungodly. 
Verse 50 says that the so basically it's, it's backsliding, if not backsliding even. Verse 50 says, the master of the servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of. So we see here that on one hand, um, losing patience in waiting for the Lord can lead to a backsliding heart and a backsliding state. You, you see some Christians who, not you obviously, and I pray that if that has been the case, that this message is for you and that you begin to walk your way back to the Lord. And it's easy. Repent, confess your sins, and straight away God picks you up and he begins to take you even further than where you were before. But in this case, we see that delaying, the fact that his coming is delayed, and we say delay based on whose timing? Based on our timing or based on God's timing? God, God's timing is never late. But in the eyes of man, if the expectation has been set, for example, that he's coming tomorrow or next week or before I need to get married or whatever, and it doesn't come, then we can see that as delay. But he has already told us nobody knows the day or the hour. And we've talked about how to manage that tension. So, but this person decides he's delaying and is not, by the way. It will come at the time he has already appointed. But because he doesn't understand what to do with the time, how to wait patiently, how to wait until it's uh, it, until we have um, the second harvest, the rapture, hasn't learned how to be patient, uh, hasn't learned from the experience of the sufferings of the prophets, uh, hasn't learned godly endurance, uh, hasn't learned and remember that God is compassionate and, and merciful and all that. Uh, because of all this, the delay catches him, you know, it takes him out um, and he goes back to his old ways as if he was never a Christian. And then verse 49, and he begins to beat his fellow servants. He begins to eat with the drunkards. The master of, this, of that servant, the Lord, will come on a day when he is not looking for him. So that attitude and that mindset will then make the person to become unaware and to become unexpectant of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when that happens, he now tells us he wasn't looking for him. He was not aware of him. So he, 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 Jesus will come on a day when he's not looking. He will come on an hour, at an hour when he's not aware of. But for those who are not of that mindset, who have continued to wait patiently, it, they will not be caught unawares. All right? So what do we do? We look daily. What do we do? We stay aware hourly. You look daily. You start each day thanking him, praising him, knowing that he might come that day. He might not come that day, but there's a possibility that it could be that day. And you let that set your mindset in everything that you do. Verse 51. And will cut him into two and appoint him his portion with hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there will be loss, suffering, which will be eternal, i.e. it's forever. For that person that wasn't looking for his coming, that wasn't waiting, that wasn't aware of when he will come. So to wrap up that particular parable, what do we see there? Number one, that we learn from the fig tree. As we see the signs, that Jesus told us about his coming, then we should know that he's around the corner. Number two, be faithful, be wise. Govern what he has put you in charge well. And we'll come to that when we look at the second parable. But be faithful, be wise, and govern whatever assignment he has put in your hand. If you're a student, that's an assignment. If you're a husband, that's an assignment. If you're a wife, that's an assignment. If you're a parent, that's an assignment. If you are a boss, that's an assignment. If you have bosses over you, that's an assignment. If you're a businessman, that's an assignment. Godly assignment. If you're a teacher, that's an assignment. If you're a pastor, that's an assignment. If you are a politician, that's an assignment. All right? If you're a career person, a professional, that is an assignment in the marketplace. 
whatever your assignment is, do it as unto the Lord. Be faithful, be wise in the way you go about it. See yourself as a trustee of God in that area of assignment and be ready to give account to him that have entrusted you with the skills, the abilities, the giftings, the opportunities that you have in that sphere of endeavor. So learn from the fig tree, be faithful, wise, and govern what God has put in charge of you well. Number three, there are bigger and eternal rewards that await you when you are faithful. There are bigger and eternal rewards that await you when you are faithful. God rewards faithfulness. Number four, there's a blessing with it when he comes. So when the Lord comes and he finds us faithful, there is a blessing. You see that in verse 4. Um, sorry, verse 46. It says, Blessed is that servant whom his servant, when he comes, will find so doing. So there's a blessing. There's a blessing. There's a blessing to do in verse 45, which is about being faithful, being wise, um, and, and governing the assignment well. Point number five, do not backslide. My heart grieves on this point because I've seen so many brothers and sisters. We started together, some of them even more fervent than you and I, preached the gospel, evangelized, won souls for Christ. And then you, you haven't seen them for a while, and then you see them five years later, ten years later, and you wonder what happened. They are backsliding. Some might even tell you they don't believe in God anymore. And you think, how? How can that? How do you get to that conclusion? Be faithful. Be patient. Do not backslide. Do not go with the ways of the world. Do not go with the ways of the world. Another example that Jesus gave us about when he's going to come, he said, as it was in the days of Noah. And then he also said, as it was in the days of Lot. Now, the situation with Lot was that his heart was beginning to get fastened to the pleasures of Sodom and Gomorrah. Because sin is pleasurable. Let's not deceive ourselves. It is. But there's a greater pleasure, a greater pleasure in being in God's presence and serving God. So do not go with the world. Do not fasten your heart with Sodom and Gomorrah. Number six, be expectant daily. Be aware every hour. Be expectant, expectant daily, be aware every hour. Point number seven, being unfaithful due to backsliding leads to judgment and loss. Being unfaithful due to backsliding leads to judgment and loss. Then we come quickly to the parable of the workers in the vineyard. This is where we now begin to talk about the marketplace. Turn with me please to Matthew 20 from verse 1. Matthew chapter 20 from verse 1. We'll close with this and we'll pray. And next week, we'll look at crowns and rewards. And I really, really want you to, to make time to be ready for that because we see from the example of people like Moses and Jesus that the promise of the reward enabled them to endure the cross, to despise the shame. Why? Because they looked to the reward. And these rewards are real. They are genuine. And they are not like any reward on earth. We're going to be looking at that. There are several rewards that God has for his people. This is not salvation now. This is on top of salvation rewards in heaven that are eternal and that are forever. Let's look at um, the parable of workers in the vineyard. So, in Matthew chapter 20, um, let's read from verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. For when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour. Now the third hour is like 9 a.m. Because the first hour is 6 a.m. So he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the what? marketplace. So the marketplace is wherever God has given you assignment. And I think nowadays we tend to use that for doing ministry outside of the walls of the church. And that's true. The, the, the role of the church, of, of, the, of the fivefold ministry, according to Ephesians chapter 4, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So you come to church to be equipped. You go out of the, quote and unquote, the church, talking about the, the walls of the church, out into the marketplace 
to do the work of the ministry. So if you're a solicitor, solicit people for Christ. If you're a businessman, do business in such a way that it furthers the work of the kingdom, it promotes the kingdom, and you do it the kingdom way. And you use the resources, the funds, the profits that God gives you from there to support missions, to support the work of the Lord. Um, if you're a teacher, find a way to teach like Jesus teach, the great rabbi, the great teacher, um, and, and teach people about Christ, find a way. So whatever area of influence God has given you in your own marketplace, this scripture, this parable applies to you. So it says, um, verse 3 again, and he went out about the third hour. So he started in verse 1, in the first hour, 6 a.m., early in the morning in verse 3 he now goes to check the progress all right so at the third hour he goes to check the progress um so he comes and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace so he didn't like that so god is checking jesus is checking are you idle in your marketplace you know whatsoever your hand finds to do do it with all of your heart the bible says seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all the other things will be added unto you don't be idle in the marketplace but what's your marketplace so whilst we're waiting be active in the marketplace you see waiting therefore is not an opportunity to be idle waiting is not an opportunity to throw up your hands and say well that's it unless i'm in church as a pastor or doing something in the church then uh, uh, then i'm just wasting my time because you see i've got to wait no wait in the marketplace work in the marketplace Whilst waiting, be not, do not be idle in the marketplace. Verse 4, And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. So he found some people that were idle in the marketplace, and he says, Don't be idle. Come on. There's some work for you to do. Work for the Lord, even in the marketplace. And they went. And this is a word for somebody. In that marketplace, you already are in there doing quote and unquote what the world calls secular business but then it's a marketplace where you can also be used by god when you ask god pray you'll be amazed at how god will lead people your way i'll give you a short testimony on this i remember when i was working in the finance industry um as an, i was managing an investment portfolio and there was a client of mine who sat next to my desk who we were talking about his business that he wanted to finance and uh, we're looking at the proposal and trying and I'm analyzing the investment opportunity and then he said to me i want to be like you true testimony i said what do you mean he said there is something about you and i just want to be like you oh well talk about an opportunity so i started talk, talking to him about jesus and to cut a long story short, he gave his life to Christ in the marketplace, not in the church. So there are opportunities there. If you live for Christ, he will draw the fishes towards you. And for him, you become a fisher of men. Verse 5. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. So what does this tell us? That even though we're waiting for him to come back, he's checking on us. He's saying, come on, I hope you're not being idle. I hope you're active in the marketplace. I hope you're doing the work of the ministry. He, he gave us two things. Go ye. Um, uh, he also told us, um, seek ye. Go ye into the world, make disciples of all nations. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Go ye, seek ye. In the marketplace, put us in your mind have that go ye and seek your commitment hallelujah and then verse 6 and about the 11th hour now the 11th hour is a phrase that we now use to mean um <laughs> it's almost there you know so if you said that somebody came at the 11th hour you are saying that they came they almost didn't make it but they just made it at the 11th hour you know uh, they just kind of nicked in so at the 11th hour, when it was almost over, because the 11th hour comes before the 12th hour, and the 12th hour is the close of day. The 12th hour uh, is equivalent. Um, the 11th hour is 5 p.m. So the 12th hour is equivalent to 6 p.m. Work is over. That's evening time. All right? 
it's all done. It's, it's like exam, pencils up. But at the eleventh hour, he went out and found, he still found others standing idle. And he said to them, why have you been standing idle here all day? They said to him, because no one hired us. So he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. Listen, they said no one hired us. He said, don't wait to be hired. Go into the vineyard, work. You have already been chosen. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. All right? So, and you, are, you have been called to declare the glory of the Lord. Don't wait until somebody gives you a specific assignment. You already have the go ye assignment. You already have the seek ye assignment. You already have the assignment of whatever your hand finds to do, do with all of your heart. You have the assignment of making disciples. You have the assignment of uh, being a witness to Christ. You don't need any calling, any other calling for those assignments. Be faithful in that assignment. Be wise in that assignment. Make sure that you uh, govern and, uh, and you, you govern those assignments very well. So he says, look, go into the, into the vineyard and work. So verse 8, when evening comes, so that's it. It's all over. 6 p.m. The owner, that's the 12th hour. The owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages. So we see that there is reward for being faithful in the marketplace. And it doesn't matter what time you decide to be faithful, what time you decide to work in the marketplace, what time you decide to be wise about it. It doesn't matter whether yours was in the first hour, the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, or even the eleventh hour. What we see from this scripture, this parable, is that they all got exactly the same reward. So there's a reward. So he called the laborers, he gave them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. It's even interesting the way Jesus did it. He started with the last, not even those who have been there from the first hour. And when those who were hired about the eleventh hour, when they came, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, those who were hired at the first hour, they thought that because they have worked longer, they should receive more. You see, the, the, the way God judges is different from the way man judges. God is merciful. God is compassionate. It's almost like the story of the, of the prodigal son and the one that's, that was at home, that was jealous of the lavishness of the father on the prodigal and profligate son that wasted the resources. And he was complaining. And we see that same situation here. It was jealousy almost even. By his own reckoning, he should have gotten more. They think they should have gotten more. So they complained, verse 11, against the landowner, verse 12. They said that this last man have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us. You have borne the burden, who have borne the burden of the heat of the day. But he said to them, look, I haven't done you any wrong. What I agreed with you, that's what I've given you. Verse 14, take what is yours, go your way. If I wish to give this last man the same as you, what's that to do with you? All right. So it's not too late to join the work and you will be rewarded. Verse 16 tells us, so the last will be the first and the first last. For many are called, but few are chosen. If you're a Christian, you've already been chosen. If you're not a Christian, what are you waiting for? The call has been made. Jesus made it clear. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The husband man is around the corner. Have you been idle in the marketplace? For you as Christian, do not be weary in well-doing. Don't get tired. For God is coming with his reward. And his compassionate, is merciful. His grace is available for you. So what do we learn from this? Walk till evening time. Don't be like those that start and then stop before the end. What's your marketplace? Don't stand idle in the marketplace. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your heart. You're already called. You're already chosen. Don't wait to be called again. You've been called to go ye. You've been called to seek ye. Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel. If you can't physically go, go support those who are, who are on the field. Support the missionaries. Support the churches. Support those 
who are really, really doing the work of the Lord, bringing souls to the kingdom and equipping and discipling them. And you yourself, witness to somebody, lead somebody to Christ, disciple somebody. In fact, let me challenge you. Right now, if the Lord were to come and to say, who have you witnessed to in the last one month? Remember, it's the Holy Spirit that does the work of salvation. But our job is to witness, to tell them, who have you told? Who have you told? Who are you discipling right now? Who have you got on your list that you are bringing up in the way of the Lord? I'm going to leave that challenge with you. I want you to take it away prayerfully and go to God so that when he comes, let him find you faithful over that which he, have put, he has put in your hand. It's not too late to join the vineyard. Run the race that is given to you. Focus on your own assignment. Walk, walk out of your love for Jesus. Walk. Walk in obedience to his call. Walk. Walk with expectation of a heavenly reward. Win souls. Lay up treasures in heaven. Live with the end in mind. Occupy till I come. Occupy. When the Lord comes, will you find faith on earth? Don't grow weary in waiting for the Lord. Persevere in faith. What do you do while awaiting the return of our Lord Jesus Christ? Now you've got some ideas. Now you understand the heart of God. Now you know that waiting for God is not a passive activity, but an active one. Now you know that you are supposed to be active in the marketplace. And if you are called to be in the fourfold, I mean fivefold ministry, be active and be faithful in there. Understand your assignments. Occupy your, your place. Don't let anyone take it. Occupy till I come. Let us pray. Father, for those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, and who you, you've made available to be able to have the opportunity to listen to this message, I ask, Lord God, that you touch their heart and that you bring them to the acknowledgement of their sins. I pray for forgiveness of sins. If that is you, it's not an accident that this message has reached you. And I ask that you ask the Lord to come into your heart right now. The Lord is coming. What will he find you doing when he comes? Will he find faith in you when he comes? Do you have faith in him? You can ask the Lord to come into your, into your heart right now by saying this simple prayer. Heavenly Father, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I confess my sins. I ask that you forgive me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Lord, because you rose again on the third day and you are alive forevermore. I look forward to your coming again. Give me grace to live for you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer for the first time or you are recommitting your life to Christ, be assured, your name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Hallelujah. And find a good um, Bible-believing church. I know COVID-19 means that church is now going on online, but stay with us online and you'll be fed with the Word of God. Um, when the COVID-19 is over, find a local church that is close to you. Do not forsake the assembly of yourselves together, the Bible says, especially as we see the day approaching. Get a Bible, begin to read it, begin to pray, and the Holy Spirit will lead you. And if you have any questions and if there's any way we can support your Christian journey, email us at info at vinechurchlondon.org.uk info at vinechurchlondon.org.uk Hopefully they will put that on the screen um, later. Um, if you have prayer requests or any way we can, we can help you in your Christian journey. If you are already a Christian and you become weary, all this waiting, even the book of Peter tells us that waiting and waiting, some have become weary. They've been saying, Jesus is coming for since I was born, you know, and look, I've got to get on with my life. I want to say to you that 
He is coming. <laughs> he really is coming. And I hope that you've been encouraged today. And if you're backsliding, why don't you just pray right now? And just talk to him. Ask him to forgive you. If you've been like that on white servants that have left their duty post and have joined in with the ungodly and with the drunkards and backsliding, you can come back. Heavenly Father, Lord, pray this prayer. Just, just talk to him. I confess my sins. Heal me of backsliding. Give me freshness in your presence. I come back to you. Help me to work the, the work of faith. That when you come, you'll find faith in me. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. And finally, for the Christian, you've been faithful. You're doing the best that you can. But you are getting confused about while waiting. Do I stop working? Do I not prioritize my, my business and my projects? Hopefully, you've got clarity now. Your, even your business, your marriage, your education, all of it, they are assignments. They are your place in the marketplace. Why don't you pray right now that God will help you in the marketplace? Father Lord, we just pray that in whatever our marketplace is, we pray for grace, we pray for wisdom, we pray for understanding. Help us to be faithful there. Help us to be wise there. Help us to govern well. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. So next week, we're going to continue with crowns and rewards. It's really, really wonderful teaching. It's a teaching of hope. It's a teaching of grace. It will bless you. So make sure you join us 11 a.m. British Standard Time next Sunday.